Hey, Billy Glisson with PowerCore 360. And in this video, we'll get into some exercise science, specifically some applied anatomy of the hitting shoulder, spine, and body for volleyball power hitting. I'll share with you some of my conversation from a former player, now volleyball coach, and a physical trainer who had asked me why we teach what we teach at PowerCore 360 from a science perspective. Hey, we'll discuss the high elbow setup versus what we teach at PowerCore 360, which is what we call a neutral shoulder setup why we think the neutral shoulder setup is a much more powerful and a better option to choose from a power perspective based on some science. Hey, stick around to the end of this video. I'll give you free access to our volleyball power hitting masterclass, our private Facebook group. I'm a science guy, right? So I'd like to dig a little deeper and have something, some foundation behind my beliefs. You gotta, you know, you everybody's choosing what they wanna believe, but I like, I'm, I'm an exercise physiologist. I have a science background. I go to the science and I go to the physiology and we can say things like biomechanics, but I go in deeper. What's the anatomy? What are the lines of pull of muscles and what's the lines of pull and fashion? So that's, that's where I go from. Right. And so with that being said, let's dig into that and let's record, let's record this. So at least you'll have a conversation to go back to. Right. And if you want to pull from this, you can, but it, it's what I believe in, right. It's my belief, but it's based on, what I was taught in college. And then since then for 30 or 40 years, still studying the body, the anatomy, the physiology and what makes sense. So period. Um, let's, let's just dissect, let's get into the shoulder a little bit, right? Because I looked at a couple of the videos that you sent and yeah, I mean, they're, they are tall females with really long arms and they, because the length of their arm, they can create a lot of arm speed, right? And they're tall and they get there on a women's net. They can hit the ball down. Cool. Great. So they're having success with that. <clears throat> but it's not based on any anatomy except theirs. Theirs is just a long arm. They're going to create long. They're going to create a lot of arm speed and ball speed because of the length of their arm and their height, their stature. Cool. But let's go deeper than that. Let's just look at the shoulder in, in, in general, male or female. It doesn't matter which, which gender you want to go to. So when you say, I know what I know and I know what I don't, and you're the expert, I'm, I am like eating this up. Like, cool. tell me. Right. So we're just, um, we're just really both really yeah. open-minded to hearing. E eager, eager for knowledge. I'm honestly. going to try to, to give you some information and some references. And, and when you say research, be careful because research doesn't mean that these are researched articles, but let's just say science, because there are plenty of textbooks on anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, and I'm going to show you one book that you guys should use, okay? And so this is a book by Thomas Myers. So you can look at this. It's called Anatomy Trains, right? And I would tell you that a lot of really good people that want to understand the body and how to create rotational power and load into the body slings, they will learn this. So you guys should have this book. It's very technical, but it's a science book, right? And it's going to get into... Um, <clears throat> it's going to get into the fascia. So let's, let's explain that. Let's go kind of surface level. You, we, we dig into the body. We take the skin off the outer layer, just the skin underneath the skin is fascia. Okay. And it completely goes from the tip of your head to around your feet, 360 degrees around your body, right? That fascia is an elastic tissue, right? And it functions and it does different things, but it actually holds the muscles in place there are attachments from the muscle to the fascia, but the fascia by itself is very elastic tissue, right? So what Thomas Myers did with anatomy trains is said, you know, there are different lines of fascia that for movement, not sports movement, just movement in period. But of course, it'll, it, there's a lot of sports application in here, right? They'll show throwing, hitting, kicking, golf swing. They'll show a lot of things in there. So there's some practical application, right? If I took and gave you a, if I just took some rubber tubing, elastic band, any kind of elastic tissue. So here's a resistance band, right? Um, and so one of the things I want you to understand when we start talking about different lines of pull, lines of pull can be your, let's keep it simple. Here's your tricep and it's the triceps, a big hitting muscle, especially in a high elbow. A lot of the power comes from the tricep extending the elbow, but the tricep runs from the elbow down underneath, right? <clears throat> and so if you look at the length of that muscle, the line of pull at that muscle, if you just look from my elbow to my shoulder, 
that's the line of pull. It's straight, right? When the, when the elbow extends, it's extending because those muscles have been lengthened and now they shorten, but they shorten in a direction and a line of pull of the muscle, right? When you really start to need to understand how do you create force or torque or power for, in this case, the arm swing, and you start looking in the shoulder and you can start saying, what are the benefits of high elbow? What are the downsides of high elbow, right? From a force production perspective. So how do you hit harder, okay? Um, you can, if you teach a high elbow, if you use a high elbow, a couple things about it, it is so much easier to teach. It is less complex, right? Because Corey, to your point, when you jump, the arms naturally assist the jumping motion of the body to go overhead. Okay. And this is why it's so hard when you're working with volleyball athletes who are learning to jump, to block jump, or to jump up to do their approach. Because what they have to, in, that, in essence, learn is how to lift the left arm up, point at the ball, just like they were going to hit. That's the natural motion. But the right arm can't do that. If the right arm goes all the way up there, there's not enough time in the air to do that and do this and do this. So you'll see with a lot of people, and in just a second, I'm going to show you a couple examples of the model I like. I also am going to show you a Olympic player. Um, and I'm going to show you the model of, of movement I like, but I'm going to back it up with this is why we like it from lines of pull of the muscles, lines of pull in the fascia that Thomas Myers talks about in the book Anatomy Trains that I just showed you. And I'm going to try to dig into that as quickly and, and succinctly as I can, but also try to do it in a way that's, that's visual and, and somewhat understandable for you guys, right? So <clears throat> bear with me. I'm going to pull up the video, uh, a video. Bear with me just a second. I actually pulled it up for our session last night for the athletes and parents. Okay. How much do you need to for us to mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. This is yep. one of the videos we use when, in our clinics, right? And we use in the master class. If you've been in there, it's in there, right? And so the guy that's getting ready to hit number one, red jersey left side is Matt Anderson. He's been on the men's U.S. Olympic team for at least two or three Olympics, right? And in my opinion, he is the poster child for what we teach on, on the men's side, but we certainly can show you, we can show you a lady that played uh, for Brazil in the Olympics that uses the same mechanics as a female, right? So if we're looking at body position, right? So this is what we teach. We teach the athlete to go up and learn to develop the reverse power C where the legs are up behind the body. You'll also notice that, Corey, obviously when you see dunkers, they'll do, they'll get in the same position. But for rotational power, the legs come up behind the body, belly button is facing the right antenna. And if we look now at the upper body, you're seeing how his torso goes from right there, his, his sternum, right? The number one on his jersey is not even facing quite the right antenna. But as he goes up in the air, See how his thoracic spine turns to the right sideline? His hips and pelvis have already started to turn from right antenna to left. And so what's that doing? It's stretching the abdominal muscles, right? And it's mm -hmm. stretching the fascia that goes from his left hip, front of his left pelvis, to his lower part of his right rib cage, okay? And that is one of the fascial lines called spiral line because it spirals diagonally across the body. And, and, and it works in volleyball, it's in the human body, it's in male's human body, it's in female's human body, because the fascia has these different lines, right, that we're talking about, and one of them has happens to be, and I'll show you, I'm going to give you a visual, so that you're not just going by words, right? All three of us have this, every athlete you train have this, so we have a spiral line that goes from the right rib cage down across the belly to the front of the left hip and pelvis, right? So when you do what Ben Anderson does, when you do what we teach, is they go in the air and they get in the reverse power C, the chest is turning to the right, hips are, they'll turn a little bit right first, and then they kick the feet and the hips and pelvis start to go left. It creates this big stretch through the muscles of the obliques, because internal, external obliques are going there and going there. Um, rectus abdominis goes up and down, but we've got the spiral lines of the fascia that are going honestly from the left side of the hip across to here, but there, it's also going up across your right pec and into your right shoulder. So you've got this huge diagonal line, elastic line that goes from left hip to right shoulder. 
So as I start to demonstrate here and then go back to the video of Matt Anderson, as they start to turn their chest and shoulders, right? Rotationally stretching, rotationally loading into this spiral line with the legs up like this. Then it basically, when the arm gets up in this position and the, the, the feet start to kick, it, it is basically stretching and causing this quick stretch. And then what we call stretch shortening cycle and strength conditioning terms, myotatic reflex. You can research it. It's all out there. It's been out there for years. It's a part of the nervous system. It's a reflex. It's built into hardwired into our bodies. But when these muscles stretch real quickly, you fire in the abdominal muscles. You fire in the hip muscles. You fire in the pec muscle. If the right hand and arm is not up overhead, and I'll show you why in a minute, if it's pulled back underneath here and the arm goes up here, you're going to get a stretch from here all the way across the front of the shoulder, across the pec, across the abs, into the hips and pelvis. And when the feet kick and the hip starts to turn left, you'll notice it. You'll see, in the, and I talk about it two or three times in assessments that are on the Facebook group this week, how if the hips are turning right, excuse me, right to left for the athlete, the ideal mechanics are for a very mature athlete, like world-class best athletes, best mechanics, the right arm is going up into external rotation. The chest is turning right while the pelvis is turning left. That, in essence, puts a stretch on pectoralis major, big muscle here in your chest, anterior deltoid, internal rotators of the shoulder, and then all the fascia that's more superficial to that, right? That creates the stretch shortening cycle. The stretch shortening cycle or myotatic reflex means this. If I take a muscle, my tricep, and I lift it up here slowly, the muscles will stretch, but because the movement and the load is slow, I won't get a stretch shortening cycle or a myotatic reflex in my tricep or any other muscle. If the arm comes up quick and snaps back quickly, the sensors, the nerve sensors in the muscles will basically stretch very quickly. It's the body's um, safety device. It's a safety device created by these sensors, nerve sensors in the muscles that will cause that muscle because the body is trying to protect that muscle from being torn. So instead of it going back real fast in the opposite direction, it will automatically subconsciously without any thought on your behalf, it will contract these muscles and it will contract and shorten them, pulling the muscle back with so much more force and speed that you can consciously do under your own control, okay? When okay. you do plyometric jumps, Corey, you're doing the same thing in your calves, your quads, your butt, your hamstrings, right? You, that's, that's part of what you're doing when, when you're doing vert training and you're doing plyos. You're basically teaching and leveraging the myotatic reflex, the stretch shortening cycle, in a lot of the jumping muscles to create vertical forces so they can jump higher, okay? Right. Back now to the body. When you get up into what Matt Anderson's doing here, if you look at this once again, so here he is, he's up in the reverse power C. What's gonna happen is he's gonna kick his feet. The kick of the feet does what? You'll notice the kick of the feet starts this wound up energy as we call it, right? And it turns his hips and pelvis, his belly button, hips and pelvis from right antenna to left. What I was saying a minute ago is watch this. His pelvis is turning to his left and his right arm and shoulder are going up, guess where? into external rotation. So there's the big time stretch across the front of his abs, across the front of his pecs, across the anterior deltoid, on his right shoulder, internal rotators are getting stretched. And the sequence and timing of everything, it's summation of forces, right? If you went to talk to somebody in kinesiology or biomechanics, they'll talk about and they'll understand summation of forces. In other words, if I'm just swinging my arm, all the forces I really get are from my tricep, a little bit of shoulder, and depending on how much shoulder turn I get, I'm going to be able to add the forces together from a couple of different muscle groups. Let's just call that three different muscle groups. But if we get the whole out, if we get the athlete to do what Matt Anderson does, and the best hitters, in my opinion, do, they're stretching muscles from the front of their quads, their hip flexors, their ab muscles, their chest muscles, their pec muscles, their tricep, their shoulder the rotator cuff, all those muscles, many more muscles can create more power than just when, when you lift up the arm and just do a high elbow, right? You're, all, you're limited to just a few sets of muscle groups. When you rotate your body, now you can take in and stretch and load and use the forces or torque, if you want to call it that, that's created from your legs, your hips, your abs, your back, your stomach, your chest, your arm, your all that stuff put together. So 
from a force development perspective, you can create more force. If you create more force, that means you're going to hit the ball harder, right? It doesn't matter if your hand's moving any faster, but just the force behind your hand contacting the ball, the ball will come off of your hand with more force, right? Yep. If you can now take advantage of, so remember, there's fascia that's being stretched, there's muscles that's being stretched. From a performance perspective, that's what we're teaching. And we're not teaching it. This is not, Danny, you said this is my stuff. It's not my stuff. All I'm doing, I'm the messenger. I'm, I'm communicating what I learned in school, what right. I learned in graduate school, what I've learned since then by listening to people that know more than I do about the body and biomechanics and physiology and the nervous system and how it all functions together. So what I'm telling you and showing you is an example of what I, the model I like, the model I believe in, but it's based mm -hmm. on how many muscles can I load? How much fascia can I load? And I want to create more forces across bigger muscles that can be used to hit the ball harder and with more arm speed, which will result in, in more ball speed, to hit the ball harder. At the same time, there's this is a two-prong um, issue. It's about performance and it's about injury prevention. It's real easy for someone to go teach a high elbow swing. There's no doubt you can teach it faster and easier because the natural motion is to jump and do this, right? You have a dilemma. So you had Allison, the mom in last night, right? And a lot of the parents that are coming to us and doing our stuff are former players. They're not all, but I can tell you when we run a clinic, at least half now of the parents, when I ask them at the start of our clinic, and I always ask the parents, what do you want from this clinic? Right. What, what do you what, what do you want your athlete to get out of this? What you would expect to hear is I want them to crush the ball. There's there's some parents that say that they want them to hit harder. That's great. Yeah. At least half of them say, I don't want my kids shoulder tore up. Right. right. I don't want their back tore up because they're seeing that stuff happening. And then, of course, we we work on landing to protect the knees, landing on two feet, like I said about Sloan last night. Right. We don't want her landing on one foot because if she comes down on one foot, there's a higher risk she's going to blow out her ACL, especially now there is gender concerns with Q angle and all this other stuff. When you get into the hips, females are more prone to ACL injuries, right? So part of what we do is very much twofold or two prong. We're always trying to improve performance. And we're also then also at the same time, if you do the right things, you're trying to reduce the stress on the shoulder. If you just do the high elbow, and we'll get into more of this in a second, you can create less force with a high elbow than you can if you're creating all the big muscles and winding up, loading up rotationally, more muscles, more power, more fascia. We already went through that. When you go high elbow, let's get into a couple specific things, right? So you guys do this. Take your left hand. You guys are all right-handers, I'm assuming. I'm a lefty. All right. Well, you, you'll, you'll do the opposite thing then. You're used to that. <laughs> Take your right hand up or your left hand up, your hitting arm up, and take it up slowly up overhead, like high elbow, right? That's a natural movement, okay? Yeah. As you're doing that, I'd like you to take, um, Danny, in your case, take your fingers of your left hand and put them in on your right pec muscle, right? And I want you to, as you take your arm up, so bring your arm down and slowly take your arm up, and you'll feel a little movement of the pec in there, but you're not going to feel a big stretch in there, okay? What I'm going to tell you is that the pectoralis major attaches like a fan muscle to your clavicle down around your sternum, and those fibers go up diagonally. Let me get this off the screen for a second so I can see myself. Those fibers go from the clavicle. Most of them go from your sternum like a fan, and they go like this, and they attach to your arm up here, okay? When you lift your arm up overhead, the pec major really doesn't get stretched, okay? When you do this, if you rotate around and you take your arm, low elbow, and be careful when people say low elbow, it's like they're trying to say it's negative. It's not negative. Uh, Get into the position of the shoulder. The shoulder's actually in what we call a neutral position, right? <clears throat> the joint is, is in a neutral position. But anyway, the point I really wanna make before I lose my train of thought is, as you load around to your right, which is the same thing you saw Matt Anderson doing in the air, because if we can turn to sh shoulders to the right, the T-spine, we get that stretch through the abdominal muscles, we get that stretch through the fascia, right? From your left hip to your right rib cage, right. if you're a right-hander, for, for um, Corey, it's gonna be the opposite direction. But anyway, 
Now, if I take my right shoulder blade, my scap, right? Because your scap, right? Here's your right shoulder blade. This is what it looks like. This is the clavicle in front. This is the shoulder blade. So from behind, you've got a right shoulder blade and the left. That and your, your upper arm bone, the humerus, create the shoulder joint. That is the shoulder joint. And the shoulder joint, because of the scap or scapula, moves around. It kind of floats around on the rib cage, right? Okay. When you teach what we teach, and you guys haven't really seen or got into that yet, but, but it's, it's in there. It's in the master class. <clears throat> The right scap, this is the inside of it. This would be facing just like mine would be here. So many young athletes, why they walk in and their scaps are tilted, they're they're rotated and they're rotated up. And so they walk in like most high school athletes like this, okay? Yeah. And their shoulder is already in a position where raising the arm up overhead basically we'll do a couple of things. And I, I'm gonna come back to that because I, I, wanna, I wanna finish the thought on the pectoralis major before I get confused here, okay? A typical high school player, and it doesn't, for sure females, but a lot of boys and males are doing the same thing. They walk in, they're especially their hitting arm shoulder is forward and tilted, right? Yep. When they go into a high elbow, their shoulder, because the shoulder blade's tilted, they basically will take their humeral head and they'll run it into the top of the scapula, right? That's the kid, Danny, that walks into your practice and says, I'm having pain on the front top side of my shoulder. What that is, is supraspinatus is your top rotator cuff muscle. It lays in this groove and it runs through this little opening right there and it attaches to the top of the humerus, the humeral head here, okay? And so when an athlete raises up and does their arm like this or does this, if this shoulder blade doesn't move down and flatten and do what it needs to do, it will not. It will stay in this position. The humeral head will come up and it'll pinch off on the supraspinatus, right? That's the athlete that walks up to you and says, I'm having shoulder pain out in front of the shoulder and on top. That's just the body's response saying something's happening. And the more you do it, the more volume you do it, and the faster you do it without rest and recovery, you know, that's going to happen. It's That's the kid that's having pain. That's a mechanical problem. It's also a strength and conditioning and a movement pattern problem, okay? Because what happens is every joint in the body, we're talking about the shoulder here, has to get stability and control from somewhere, right? Most of these young kids that are walking in, it's the pec minor, a small pec muscle group that attaches to your rib cage and up in then to the shoulder and shoulder blade complex. It is short and it's pulling it over and internally rotating it, but it's providing stability to the shoulder and to the arm. When a high elbow is performed, that kid that shows up, and not everybody shows up with that, depends on the structure of, of their shoulder. But if they start having pain, you know, then the high elbow is the cause of that, right? That movement with the hand going up ahead, whether they're swinging or even jumping, it could create that pain, right? The fix for this is you could go over and say, well, I'm going to go do corner stretches and I'm going to go work on the pec and I'm going to stretch the pec minor, okay? But if you do that and you don't turn on the muscles of underneath your shoulder blade and pull the shoulder back down where it's supposed to move to, it's not fixed there, it needs to be able to move to that spot. But if, in, but if you don't do something to actually turn on something that's going to stabilize the shoulder when the pec minor lets go, now you've got a shoulder that's moving around and you might have an injury on your hand. So don't just go do passive stretches and do the corner stretch that's been around for years because you're going to open something up, but you haven't stabilized it. Now that kid's shoulder is at risk right now, okay? So what you want to do is when we're teaching in the master class, we teach them starting in about week five, week six, to start connecting or, or, right. or, or scap loading as it's a baseball term, but we've stole it from baseball. We are teaching them how to take the muscles underneath the shoulder blade, right? Um, and, and flatten that down to the rib cage so that their shoulder blade moves and gets them out of this forward rounded internally rotated position. So that basically what happens is now, if I move the arm back down here, the shoulder blade is flattening or connecting first. The humerus is coming back. Now, here's the real key. Here's the, why this 10-minute verbiage went into. That's the science. If my arm's coming down here and I go into external rotation, now because of the fibers of the pec major, 
those fibers are now stretched. They are now engaged in the movement, right? So I had you a minute ago do this. You didn't feel any stretch in your pec major, right? Now I want you to do this. I want you to turn your body to the right, to your left, Corey. I want you to keep your elbow down below the shoulder level and just slowly pick up your right arm into external rotation. Just stay there for a second right. because just staying there, go ahead and turn there and get there. You are gonna feel muscles through your abs, through your core stretching. And you're now going to feel, if you put your hand on your pec, right? You're gonna feel a stretch in your pec major, okay? Right. That is a huge muscle that will generate all kinds of forces for throwing or hitting a ball or any kind of sports implement overhead, right? So here's what, here's what volleyball does that's different from every other overhand throwing or hitting sport. They teach a motion that doesn't make any anatomical, biomechanical, physiological sense. Nobody else, no other sport teaches that, right? So let's talk about American sports. A baseball pitcher does not raise their arm up and do this and throw and keep their arm on this side of the body. What do they do? They are loading the same way I'm telling you, right? They're rotating back. The shoulder elbow is down below the shoulder. Why? Because now the shoulder blade the shoulder itself, the humeral head can sit, the rotator cuff can do its job and pull it in to that um, the capsule there, the joint, keep it there as the arm rotates. It doesn't come up and pinch on the supraspinatus. And so it puts the, the shoulder in a muscle, the shoulder in a position to stre stretch the pec major. And because everything else we've already talked about, the ab muscles are being stretched, the leg muscles, the hip muscles, the fascia around there are being stretched, right? That's why people that throw 90 to 100 miles an hour, that's how they can do it and, and not have the stress on the shoulder or the back because they're spreading the forces off the shoulder, spreading it out across the entire body. Cool? Right. Yes. Football quarterbacks, how do they throw? Same way. They rotate, the arm comes up, it's the same thing, right? And you're going to see the position of the arm, the elbow needs to be slightly lower than the shoulder for the shoulder joint to have stability and to be able to generate and tolerate the shoulder torque. Now, the, the, the really important thing is it's not just generate because you can create arm speed and shoulder torque here, but it's not gonna be tolerated very well long-term, right? Right. Cool, so um, what else? Uh, javelin throwers, Who's, mm -hmm. they throw a javelin. Do they throw like this? No, what do they do? The arm comes back, they do this. All the reasons I'm telling you, they're loading into the fascia, they're loading into the lines of pull of the muscles, and especially the pec major. It's a huge muscle that needs to be engaged. Is it harder to teach that in volleyball? Absolutely it is. That's why every kid that I talk to and every parent I talk to, I say to them, this is not easy. This is not the basic way to hit a volleyball. The basic way when you're 12 or 10 to learn to get a hit a volleyball, volleyball over the net, you, you guys teach it, right? You do this, you do this, and it's like throwing darts because all you really have to move is your elbow, okay? Now, the problem is 12s and 10s and 11s can't get the ball over the net. Why? Because all they're using is their tricep, and their tricep is about this big with no strength. So what happens is this. In time, they'll start learning as they develop, and especially if they have someone that will teach them that understands movement and how to create more arm speed with less stress on the shoulder, is you'll start saying, okay, well, instead of lifting the arm up overhead, what about if we did this? Because now instead of just using the tricep, we'll start to use the rotator cuff, we'll start to use the pec, the anterior deltoid. If we turn our shoulder and get some separation between turn and hip and shoulder separation, the ab muscles, the fascia will stretch. And then and we just can go down the kinetic chain into the legs and say, guess what? Do you want to drive a Volkswagen or do you want to drive a Corvette? If you're wanting power and speed, you drive the Corvette because it's a bigger motor, right? A, the thing we use in the clinics we talk about is a Volkswagen, even like a Super Beetle turbocharged, it's 75 horse. So for a little car, that little engine will put out a lot of force. That's the high elbow. So you can hit the ball hard that way, right? But you can't hit it near as hard once you learn how to fire up the 600 power Corvette engine, right? That's what we're teaching them is use the Corvette engine. And then when you load into the fascia, it creates what we call effortless power, which by the way, we own the trademark on, right? Effortless power means that you stretch and load into the fascia and every sport does it except volleyball because we've got people in volleyball that are not basing it on science and anatomy. They're basing it on what they taught or what they heard or what they learned somewhere else. 
But if they actually will take the time and go talk to someone that understands the anatomy, understands the physiology, understands loading, the biomechanics, and truly understands it, and don't just throw the terms around, right? They can really get down into the level of what's going on in the shoulder, what's going on in the core, what's going on in the spine, what's going on in the hips. That's what we're doing. We're figuring out how do you turn your body, load your body in an advanced way that every other sport in the world does, except volleyball. How do you do that to create more force, more arm speed, and tolerate it? Because here's the decision that people have to make that are teaching high elbow. If you're teaching that, yes, it's simpler to teach. And if you don't want to have to go spend weeks and hours and years making that athlete, quote, world-class from a mechanical perspective, then go teach the high elbow. But also understand there's an inherent risk that you might be tearing shoulders up. And I'm going to say might be is not accurate. They are tearing shoulders up. Not every kid that hit, uses a high elbow is going to hurt their shoulder or their back, okay? But there are certain structures and certain kids that just can't tolerate that position. We say with our product is this is not for the recreational athlete. This is not for the kid that wants to go play rec volleyball, right? This is for the athlete that wants to play, be a really good high school player, more than likely wants to play at a high level club, is going to have a ton of volume, and then really wants to go play college or pro ball, right? That's, that's so, so we, we don't disguise it and say this is for everybody. But it's for, especially if you're now a parent making a decision for your kid's shoulder, your kid's back, your kid's knee. And that's why I say half the people that come to our clinic, yeah, they want their kid to hit harder. They understand why that's important. But they're also mom and dad, and they don't want their kid's shoulders, ankle, knees, hips, or anything tore up. So from that perspective, that's a lot. There's more to it. Um, but when you, if you just look at the arm and shoulder from a performance perspective and an injury prevention perspective, um, that's a big part of it. Now, I'm going to say that what there's an analogy of what goes up comes down, right? So that applies to um, when an athlete's jumping and coming down, you know, like Sloan on one leg, they're coming down on one leg, there's more risk, especially on the left ACL, that's they're coming down on the left foot. You know, they're more at risk to hurt their left knee, right? Well, if we take that analogy and we talk about arm swing, it's not just about creating arm speed because there's different ways to do it. How can, we, how can we maximize how much arm force and arm speed we can generate to hit the ball harder with more force? But how, how else do we tolerate it? Well, we tolerate it by going through and doing the things with the movement of the scapula, strengthening, conditioning the shoulder to where the scap can actually connect back there where the humeral head can actually go back and stretch the, the pec major to get it as part of that. That takes time and training. That's what naturally we're doing. All these seated pull exercises, guess what we're doing? We're teaching the muscles of the shoulder blade, the T-spine and everything to move. We're building the muscle memory for this movement pattern. We're building the strength and conditioning and the mobility and stability all at the same time, right? The kids don't understand that and we don't tell them that. They, it's too much, right? But it's a great benefit. So they're working on performance. They're working on injury prevention. Now, the real point is when I create more speed coming into the ball, what slows it down? If I do old school volleyball, which says all I ever do is I let my right hand come down on the right side of the body. Now look at my right shoulder coming down, okay? Talk to me about what muscles are slowing down the humerus, right? Because it's rotating and, and, you know, going from a flex position to extended really fast. These coupled movements are happening very fast. What's slowing it down? Well, the rotator cuff on the backside, the external rotators are the muscles that actually part of the muscles that will slow internal rotation down as they swing and go into internal rotation. Those are not very big muscles. And the rotator cuff's primary job is not to create rotational forces, it's to keep the humeral head connected into the glenoid fossa. That's what this is, this little space here. Its job is because it's on the top, it's on the bottom and on all sides of this, on this humeral head. Its job is to pull it in there and allow it to be stable as the, as the arm and shoulder move. But if that's, if that's all I'm ever using to slow the arm down, and now let's talk about young high school athletes, right? How strong are they on their external rotators? The muscles that pick it up here, not very strong. Those muscles are very weak. We know they're weak because they're already in this position, right? So part of what we're doing over and over, seated pull exercises, seated push exercises, 
we are strengthening the rotator cuff. We are strengthening the muscles underneath the shoulder blade, right? That flatten that shoulder blade and connect it down because they are weak. They have no strength, no endurance in that. They don't know how to move. They don't even know it's, that this thing's back there. And it's the shoulder. That and the, and, the, and the humeral head, the arm, become the shoulder joint. All right, so if you now stand up and, um, or you don't have to stand up, but if you can try to visualize the back. And if I do this arm motion, uh, there's not very much in terms of muscle right. tissue or fascia, right. muscle or fascia tissue that's going to slow the arm down, right? And in fact, right. if you do that, you know, I can see that. If, if you do that, there's just not much on the back side of the arm to slow the arm down. Yeah, okay? this, is, this is literally going to just like tear. Yeah, of course. It puts your shoulder in an anteriorly positioned forward position. You go to any therapist or any doc that knows the shoulder, they're going to tell you that's not a good stable position to put the shoulder in, right? We, we don't teach dips. We don't teach a lot of things because of the position the shoulder gets in there, right? But that's what you guys are teaching in volleyball at a high speed, high velocity, high volume, high load. And we're wondering why kids are showing up with shoulders that are sore, that are inflamed, that are hurt, that require surgery, because people are just naively, I'm not going to say the word I want to say, they're just telling them to do that because that's what they learned or they saw somewhere else or, well, that's what somebody said without digging into the anatomy. So now let's talk about, okay, when you teach what we teach, right? So let's, let's think with the visual, the quick, simple visual is this, watch a major league pitcher, right? In any, any country, throw the ball. All right. We already talked about how they wind up and load. Now, when they, what do they do? They step, they turn their hips, they turn their chest. They use the big muscles, the fascia, the muscles, on the front side of the body, they get stretched as we go back here, those shorten, that pulls the arm forward, but the arm doesn't go on the right side of the body. It goes to the opposite hip, why? Because the arm is being pulled by the pec muscles, the fascia along this diagonal line, it's yep. just following the natural turn of the body. When the arm needs to start slowing down, it's the external rotators, but depending on the angle of the arm coming through, if it's coming across my body, I've got posterior deltoid. I've got a bunch of scap muscles. I've got the lat muscles because the lat muscles through the fascia connect to the arm up here, right? Mm -hmm. yep. They're slowing it down. My butt muscles, my left butt muscles, my left hamstring muscles for a pitcher as they bend and go forward. I'll give you a view of this, right? As they do this and do this from the backside, all the muscles from here are diagonally across from my right shoulder down to my left hip are stretching eccentrically and the fascia and the muscles are slowing down the turn of the hips, turn of the spine and the arm, right? That's why naturally when you when someone learns to throw and they learn to throw with velocity and force and speed, that's what their body's going to do, right? That's what baseball players do. It's what volleyball, it's what football players do. That's what javelin throwers, it's what every other sport except volleyball does. Okay. Right. Because volleyball thinks they've figured something out and they really haven't. They haven't studied the anatomy. They haven't looked at the other sports and say, huh, why do the other sports do it this way? Because it makes sense in terms of stretch load. And it because now because of deceleration of the arm, the chest, the shoulder, the back, the hips, we've got more motors to not only create forces, we've got more motors to slow the arm down, to slow the spine down, to slow the hips down. We've got also fascia that's back there. Once again, we've got these spiral lines that just like on the front side go from here to here, guess what we got on the back side, right? Fascia that's gonna go from there to there diagonally and muscles. So we have a lot of tissues, elastic tissues that will stretch and slow the arm down. And <clears throat> so when an athlete starts learning how to do our stuff, when we do a clinic in the first 10 minutes of the clinic as we're working on throwing, we teach them how to throw. And then we take it into hitting and, and a kid who's usually got a shoulder sh who shows up and says, I've had shoulder pain because we ask him at the start of the clinic who has shoulder pain, you know, 80% of the arms go up. And then we ask them, now how's your shoulder feels? Oh, oh my God, it feels great. Why? Because we've just taken all those isolated forces off the shoulder and spread them out throughout the entire body diagonally, obliquely in, in, in the spiral following these spiral lines, right? So it's really a matter of, it gets away from, it starts using the science and it gets away from, you know, like your opinion versus mine. It's like, no, let's, right. let's, let's not get into a pissing match. You know, right. because nobody's going to win that, right? It's just like right. what you think and what I think, it doesn't matter what we think. Right. It's got to right. be based on something. So that's the model we use. 
it just has come from me studying, being an exercise physiologist, and for 40 years, learning the body and continuing to learn how do you load, how do you unload, and how do you do it to create not only arm speed, arm torque, back torque, but how do you protect the body? Because, and now from a business perspective, are we different? Absolutely, we are, right? We're not doing the same old thing because somebody else said it should do it or this Olympic athlete does it that way. No, I use Matt Anderson because it's a visual because people can see what we teach, right? But then it's like, now let's go deeper. Let's talk about the anatomy. Let's talk about what's right. loading. Let's talk about what's unloading, what's slowing down the arm. Why do people that do it this way have shoulders that feel better 30 years later, right? Versus you can pick some Olympic athletes from the US and just because they were Olympic athletes and won gold medals, but you look at their shoulders in volleyball and they're walking around with tape all over their shoulders, right? And that's a message I say to the kids all the time. That's not a medal of honor, okay? That is telling you that mechanically, they're moving their shoulder through a way that their shoulder's not tolerating. Something mechanically is off. And I'll tell you what's off, it's this. This is not, you can generate arm speed, but you don't tolerate it very well. This is amazing. Um, we have another question. I don't want to take all of your day. Um, what causes the body to go into that reverse C position as the hitter is jumping? And how, how do you train that? How do we... What fires there? How is you train about it? That. You well, so it's my response in two simple terms, and we'll get into it deeper. You train it by creating rotational movements of the body, rotational Got love. Okay? Right. When you lift your arm up overhead, you're not creating a well, you're creating a rotational load, but in the sagittal or, or sagittal plane of the body, right? So you're creating rotation around your shoulder this way. So what does the back do? The back arches, that stretches the abdominal muscles. So a kid that's going to go phase one, a very immature throwing or overhand hitting pattern will be just arm first. And then as the athlete learns more how to use their body, they'll start arching their back. They'll use their back muscles to arch so that they're using more muscles, more power. That will stretch the abdominal muscles. And then you'll get a stretch shortening cycle out of rectus abdominis, right? Now, now that kids start showing up, showing up if they're doing a lot and if their body doesn't tolerate, now they've got shoulder pain and back pain. Why do they have back pain? Because, you know, here's my spine model, right? When they're bending, there's all these joints back there, but let's just say that they're bending and guess what they're bending at? Probably the same spot over and over and oh over. And so, you know, the analogy we use is take a metal coat hanger and start bending it. When you first start bending it at the same spot, it gets warm. Well, that's what the shoulder gets. The kid comes up to you after practice and says, coach, my shoulder hurts. What's it feel like? It just feels really hot, right? Well, okay, because it's moving at the same spot, it's impinging on supraspinatus. It's impinging on a lot of tissues at the same spot in the shoulder or in the back, same thing. The same area just keeps working, working, working. It gets to an overuse, right? Isolated forces on one spot, keep doing that on the on the coat hang, metal coat hanger. What happens? It's gonna bend, it's gonna break. So you go from a hot shoulder to an inflamed shoulder to the doctor, to the nurse, the therapist, whoever, right? To the chiro, whoever you're sending them to, right? But if you don't change the mechanics, yes, I can hit harder doing by arching my back and, and flexing my back than just using my high elbow. It's part of the maturation, the development process. It's normal, right? So to go from this to this is cool. As long as the coach knows and says, all right, cool. Now you're eight or nine and you're learning how to do that. But I'm going to show you a better, more mature, more advanced pattern. Because if you're really a serious athlete that's going to play this a long time, wants to play a long time, you probably are not going to tolerate this movement pattern very right. long, right? Okay. If you're the rec kid and you're playing for four weeks for middle school and that's cool. it whatever and they're not yeah. strong enough. they're not doing enough they're not training it's probably not a big deal have a great time go enjoy middle school mm -hmm. volleyball if you've got the high level elite athlete like sloan last night that wants to be really good and you know they're going to play national they're probably going to play open they're going to go play division one two three volleyball the volume is going to be there there's a really good chance they won't tolerate these movement patterns very long right so if the person is knowledgeable about what's going on the anatomy the physiology the movement the loading patterns and unloading what you'll say is okay hey we have a better pattern for you sloan doesn't matter for terry or tommy over here because they're the rat kid that's going to play four weeks but for you 
We're going to teach you how to rotationally load. So here's, we're, I'm going back in to answer your question. To create the reverse power C, that's partly what happens. That's exactly what happens in the master class in time. But the longer the kid raises their hand up overhead, they're not loading rotationally in this plane, right? Yeah. They're loading in the sagittal plane. We want them to load rotationally in the transverse plane of the body. So we want the shoulders going to this for right-handed hitter. We want the shoulders going to the right. We want to teach the hips to go to the left. Those are rotational movements that happen in the sagittal plane of the body. When the arm comes back then now down here, the forces of the arm and the shoulder blade are connecting to the torso, the T-spine. It's helping create that rotational load it starts happening as a function of the training. Right, right. right. So that's why we spend five or six weeks over and over and over again. You see it on every analysis that I give the kids because the natural motion, right? This is how we jump. This is what they've yeah. learned to do. And that what we tell them is it ain't easy. You have to learn to jump like this and you have to learn to do this. It's an advanced movement. And if you really want to be good and protect your shoulder and hit harder and all at the same time, that's what you got to do. But it doesn't happen overnight. The body's wired to make this happen really easy. But now we say to you, if you want to hit the ball like Matt Anderson, if you want to hit the ball like a really world-class hitter from a mechanical and power and injury prevention perspective, we're going to train you to do this. So it is elite training. And I'm, I don't like that term. It's advanced training for the athlete that wants to be an advanced hitter and not tear up their shoulder, their back or something else in the process. The reverse power C then in a short story, will happen as part of the training. It will never happen, right? Because you'll see the kids. Right. I mean, you can right. go look at a couple of the things I put up this last week, right? Where a couple of kids started to get into the reverse power C. You know why? Because they're learning how to rotationally load. Yeah. The body naturally responds and do that. I used to, I used to be probably where you were at and I, I'd see this reverse power C and I would try to train them to pick their feet up, right? right. And keep down. We went through all that like 10 years ago. And what I realized was, if I'm arching and flexing, they're not going to, it'll, it'll just start happening. So we see it. There's a kid right now in the group that's a 15 year old. Uh, OE is the one you'll see her name. Uh, EO, sorry. Elise is a 15 year old. And like three weeks ago, like her mom sent me an email and said, Oh my God, look what just happened. And I thought, Oh God, did she hurt herself? <laughs> so she sent me an email of she got into the reverse power see they were like in week three or four but they had been watching the videos yeah we were in a racquetball court and they just like it just like happened and it kind of freaked the kid out because she's like i don't even know how i did that well she right. did it because that one or two reps she actually rotated her shoulder brought her arm down and the body just responded the legs started to come up and so it's cool to watch their development but that's where the methodology comes in and knowing yeah. what to teach when to teach it, have an eye on it and know what to give them and not give them 10 things that you see wrong in right. the and in the right sequence and right order, right? That's the benefit of the master classes. That's the benefit of letting us train them, let yeah. me train them to that point yeah. and saying, now you take them on the court and yeah. take them on the court and support exactly what we're working on right. Right now, on the court, right? right? And the majority of it's going to be teach them how to connect their scap, teach them how to bring their arm down wide because we need rotational load. All right, Got the it. last thing I'm gonna tell you is Monica Wolf. Monica Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. Write that down. Mm -hmm. Hold this. She was a physical education instructor, I think in the 1940s, okay? You will be able to search her on the internet. She developed what she said was the, um, uh, I don't know what she called it, but basically it's the steps of overhand throwing development for a human being, right? So she's going to show you exactly what we just talked about. She's going to show you that when a, when a two-year-old, three-year-old starts to throw, the first thing they'll do is lift their arm up overhead. It's a very immature throwing pattern, but it starts and it's cool. And it might be what you do the first day with an eight or nine-year-old who you're trying to teach them. You teach their arm to move, right? But then very quickly, she'll start talking about stage two is... They start to turn their torso and then they bring their arm rotationally back, okay? For all the reasons we're talking about, right? Then next step is they will step, they will turn their hips, they'll get a counter rotation, they'll step, they'll turn their hips, they'll turn their chest, their arm will come through. They will rotate the body with weight shift or a step, okay? 
So I looked at that because my undergrad was in physical education. I saw this stuff 40 or 50 years ago. I was like, oh, that's interesting. But then when I started looking at volleyball, it's like, oh, so we've wrote about it. In some cases, we haven't really published anything and said, really, Monica Wolf needs to get the credit for this. Mm -hmm. But in essence, what I would tell you is you can look at the maturation process for a volleyball hitter. And this is very natural. This is this is day one, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, try to get the ball over the net. It's like throwing darts. Right. They're going to bring the arm up overhead, and they're going to start to rotate. But And then they'll start stepping with, if you look at all this, they'll step with the wrong foot. They'll step with the right foot instead of the left. So you have to train, step with the left foot, turn your hips. But ultimately, what I want you to understand is where volleyball is at is it's a very immature um, process in terms of what we're teaching. We're teaching, yes, because you're right, from a business perspective, it's easier for a club director or coach just to teach this. But honestly, in my opinion, that's irresponsible in this day and age. When there's the, the science that's out there of how do you generate and tolerate, how do you create and tolerate torque on your spine, your hips, your shoulders, there's a lot of knowledge. This is one person, me as one person. There's many other people that understand this in a lot of different sports, right? It just so happens that I ended up in volleyball with it. I have no idea how. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> but, but this is what needs to be. This is what needs to be communicated. This is what we're doing as a company. And once again, you know, all I've done is figured out. I've I've learned the science. I've stayed down deep in the rabbit holes, <clears throat> and just figured out a training methodology to teach athletes how to do this. Right. <clears throat> the final thing I'll say is, you know this. Um, I had two conversations yesterday with fathers in California of 12 year old hitters, right? That they, they want their daughter in the master class and um, young kids like that. I sit and actually I had a discussion with a 17 year old advanced hitter from Canada last week and her mom, she's, <laughs> she's college, got colleges in Canada looking at her, but they're telling her she needs to hit the ball harder. And they're saying you need to learn how to rotate, which is the good news, but nobody knows how to teach it. Right. But I sit down and I talk with the parents and like the discussions yesterday, I tell the dads or the moms, this is not easy stuff. And it's really not easy for a 12 year old. Okay. But in, in, in the parents are like, most of the time they sign up because like, but it's the right mechanics. And it's, and the window of time is really critical because yeah. 13s and 14s is when we focus because the kids will still listen, right? When they get to 15 and 16, I don't care if they're boys or girls. They don't want to listen anymore. They, it's hard to shape them. And now they've got three or four or five years of this high elbow swing. Then those swings don't go away. Or You're 20 now, it's years, so hard 20, to 20 years of it. Yeah, yeah, it's so hard to change it. So um, we've had some success changing it. And I can tell you two 17-year-olds in the last year, one of them is Roth. She's in the master class right now. She's the kid black. She's got dark. She's, she's six foot, maybe dark haired. She's from Canada. Um, she came to me in November, December with, she was shut down because of her shoulder and her parents found us. And so I did two or three weeks of training with her and her athletic trainer, um, you know, on, on teaching them basically how to move the scat first, how to connect it, how to load rotationally in two sessions, her shoulder pain went away. She was able to start swinging. Yeah. That's really fast. And now She's done the work. You see, like even yesterday, there was a couple posts of her just doing her arm stuff. She's gotten really strong, like a black band, two gray bands. You'll look at her post. -shot. There's nothing. It's nothing to her. So I'm saying to her, you got to get stronger. You start got to start going to the black bands and the orange bands. But she's actually now creating hip turn, chest turn, sequence turn. And now the arms coming through with more strength, more force, because we changed the pattern. We taught her how to connect and load her scalp how to put her shoulder in a position that it would generate and tolerate that. And then now it's paying off. She's done enough work that the body's rotating faster and she's learned how to create all this muscle mass to create and, and rotate the body with speed. And the arm's a part of it. We're not saying don't use your arm. We're just saying right. the arm is the fourth step, but right. use your legs, right. use your hip, use your core, use right. your chest and torso, stretch the pec major by bringing it down here or the pectoralis major. And now you will crush the ball. But it's taking her, and she was really fast. It's taken her probably three months to do that. That's super fast. She's 17. Take a 12-year-old, and I've had I've had four 12-year-olds. I got three 12-year-olds. One's turned 13. They're in the program now. And one of them, it's taking more time with one. 
three or four weeks into it, it was like, this is too much. And I told the mom ahead of time, I had a meeting with the mom and the kid. It's tough. I'm warning you, it's tough. It's hard. And the kid realized, oh, I don't want to do this. Fine. Okay. But the other kids are getting it. And it's cool to start to see. You'll see the kid that's on there every day that I post, right? She's 13, the little skinny kid that's hitting off the hook most of the time. She was 12 when she started a couple months ago. And she's amazing for a 12 or 13 year old, right? Yeah. And her work ethic is like none other, right? But anyway, enough said. That That's it. So can, can I just say so? Yeah, go ahead. So what I really, really want to say is obviously like Matt Anderson, he's, here's what I want to talk about is, is we're, we're teaching these kids to go from basically no rotation to almost 180 degrees. When we talk about sternum, right sideline, left sideline, all that. Yep. Matt Anderson is going to make it look, look easy, right? So when we're teaching these kids, and I just want to make sure that I'm telling the parents and the kids this exactly the way we want to, we want to say it, but it's going to look extremely it's not going to look great because we're, we're, I mean, we're teaching them this full, almost 180 degree sternum rotation. Um, basically what I've started to tell, started to tell kids, it's, it's like overtraining right now. Um, our, our, our sprinters, we have them run downhill to, to start to overtrain that rotation. So it starts to become, you know, even if we're 80%, compared to where we were at 10%, we're still, we're, we're, we're conditioning our muscles. We're con conditioning that to, to be comfortable with that, increase our power so that when we get to become Matt Anderson's level, it's, it's, it's just clockwork, right? Where we've conditioned our muscles to do that. Is that basically, because, I mean, you, you had a video of one of your players and it's, it's you know, and it just, it just looks really awkward. We're not teaching them that so that they're gonna they're gonna get it immediately, but we're we're teaching them that so they begin to condition and get used to that movement. So it's okay if we're not always 180 to 180, sideline to sideline. We're conditioning it so that it just begins to condition their muscles, muscle memory of okay, this is why we're using all of these muscle groups from sideline to sideline. Is that so is that essentially yeah. I, th I think that's very accurate. And we're trying to break them of an extension flexion pattern. Okay. 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 So to do that in the first few parts of the weeks, in the first few weeks, really the, through the eight weeks, what I tell them is I want you to think about week one. I want you to stand tall. I want your head up towards the ceiling. Why? Because I'm trying to teach them to, to put their spine in a long neutral position that they can tolerate rotation around the spine that's not bent or side bent. I want them the three places they turn in their spine, their left hip and the right hip. I want them tall to increase the speed of the turn. And I, so I'm and, and overuse is probably not the right term. Overcook is the, the word I'll use. I will overcook them to where to the point it's like I want them to, to be 100 percent focused on rotation right now. OK, yeah. and I've yep. said this once or twice in one of the, the analyses this week. Later on, probably after the eight week program, once they learn how to turn. Then I'm going to add back in a little abdominal crunch motion at the end, okay? But it also depends on the athlete. If I've got a kid who's 5'5", five, five, she's never going to be above the net unless she's got a 50-inch vert. She's never going to be above the net. So she's going to yeah. have to learn to just turn and extend up here, right? If I've got like one of those Olympians that, that Danny sent me, then they're tall, you know? They're gonna, they can get more power if they rotate and crunch a little bit. That's no different from a baseball pitcher. They rotate and they turn because the ball is going from high to low. But part of that comes down to the individual athlete. How tall are they? How high do they jump? Are they going to be hitting down balls? Or do they need to hit spinners that are going up into the hands or going on the hands and dropping in the court? So that's where we get into some individualization yeah. long term. But yes, they okay. don't need to turn 180 degrees. They probably will never turn 180 degrees with right. the chest they actually hit. But early on, I want them to focus and feel and know so they can self-correct when they realize, oh, I didn't turn. You got it. Because if they wait on me or you or Danny to train them, that's great from a revenue perspective, but that kid will drive me crazy. I don't want to spend, I don't want to say 50 times a day to them, turn, turn, turn. It's like, no, I'll turn back to them and say, what are you not doing? I don't know. Yeah. We'll figure it out. 
you're 13 or 14 or 15, and this is your third lesson, you need to start paying attention to figure out how to get better. Because I'm not going to, I'll break you, I'll financially break your parents if you work with me five days a week, right? So right. anyway. Okay, no, that's- We that's, want that's... them to rotationally load and they won't always turn 180 degrees. They, they probably never will turn 180 degrees, right. but we want them to load. And so we spend so much time saying, get your belly button to the left antenna for right hand hitter yeah. and get focused on that. Because if the belly button turns to the left antenna, they've gotten a note, enough rotation that they will hit the ball harder. Even and and one, know, thing, go ahead. One, th one thing that we did, we did realize when we were training that, and this kind of, I feel like came from my PPA training slightly, but that front left foot. Stand up, stand up. You got it on me? Mm -hmm. So that front left foot, we're making them transfer their weight to it because that way their belly button can face the left antenna. If they're turning here, they'll never, they'll never get it. So when we when we're taking the step, we're making them transfer their weight over that so that they'll actually be able to. Correct. Right. So get get to that position and hold it there. Get to your left side and hold it. Okay. So. But wait, wait. Your sternum needs to face me. Your, so step so, shift. Yeah. So. Right. Just get to your finish. Just get to your finish. So what I want is them right there. I want their head over their shoulders, their shoulder over their hips, their hips over a straight left leg, right on the ground, because that's teaching their spine to, to turn around an erect aligned spine and their right and left hips. Those are the three points of rotation that, that we're trying to teach, right? When they do that, those are the, the spine is in a good position and the hips are going to in a good position to generate and tolerate rotational forces, which is torque, okay? So yeah, there's no argument. And I think that's that's the reality of all this stuff is understanding that we're going to teach them to rotate. We're going to stay focused on rotation because, and that's it. And that's that's the, the bolus of what we're trying to teach. And then later on, we will fine tune things with them, but kids don't know how to rotate, right? I mean, if you take them in the weight room as a strength coach, kids don't know how to load their hips in the sagittal plane, how to squat or do an RDL. Now you're asking them to rotate. And by the way, you're asking them to rotate in the air and turn their right. hips. So it's very advanced, right? right. It's not for every kid. Yeah. If it was for every kid, it, yeah. We're teaching them to rotate their hips in the air. So right. what's happening on the ground is right. not as important. Right. Yes. Well, it's just, it's easy on the ground to teach it because yeah. your feet are in contact with the ground. You it's can so it, step and turn in the air. I mean, it's exactly what Matt Anderson does. It's what a lot of hitters do that are really good mechanically, that are like mature hitting mechanics in the air, right? They have went through probably all the same stages of arm up and arch and extend. And for whatever reason, I bet you buck 48, nobody taught Matt Anderson how to do that. He was a good enough athlete that he figured out by default how to do it. But not everybody figures that out. And, it, and if the coaches just keep saying, this is one of the things that drives me crazy in volleyball, this is what I tell the parents. If all you're hearing in volleyball practice is get your elbow up, get your elbow up, get your elbow up, it's time to find a new coach. Because if your kid's coming home with, with shoulder and back pain, you guys now understand mechanically why. They're creating an extension flexion pattern. It's fine, unless that kid's going to play a lot, have a lot of volume, all the stuff we said. If they are, and the kid's showing up with shoulder pain and back pain, then you ought to have a coach in your club that's like the expert that says, okay, we better go teach them how to, to load rotationally, right? And, and otherwise, I feel like it's with all the knowledge and exercise science that's out there, it's irresponsible in my opinion. And I almost think, and we've done some stuff where we've said this, I'm not an attorney, but I almost feel like they have some legal exposure. Sure. When they're just forcing kids to do that and not give them any choice or, or, or right. ignore people that have knowledge and expertise in this area, I almost feel like they're putting themselves in a, in a legal situation. Yeah, they, I'll tell you what the real problem is. We all have egos. And the problem is. is somebody has an ego that's getting stepped on, right? And, you know, I mean, who- I'm if, stepping on it. I'm stepping yeah, and, on and, it. And I am, you know, like, who are you? I mean, you know, yeah. I never played one day of volleyball in my life beyond having a beer in my hand and going to the sand court, right? That's it. Yeah. When I was hired at Front Range, you'll enjoy this. Jim Murray, who's still the director there, 
you know, Jim Murray was a college coach. He was a youth national team coach. 24 years ago, we're in an interview in Denver and a friend of mine who was an athletic trainer and strength coach who I, I had trained years ago in Texas was, was working at Crossroads. He was the athletic trainer at Crossroads for injuries, you know, 25 years ago. And he told Jim, Jim, you should hire Billy, right? Because he'll do strength conditioning. And he'll do this stuff for your program. Jim sit with me and he says, why on earth would I hire someone that's never played volleyball to teach me how to train my volleyball players? And I said to him, real simple, I don't, I'm a science guy. I don't right. come to you with what's in, there was no YouTube in those days. There was no internet probably even then. I'm not just repeating stuff that somebody else said. I'm a science guy. I don't do things because at the time I'd looked at their strength program. Their strength stuff was based on Nebraska and CU, University of Colorado, you know? And I said, I don't do things because Nebraska does it. I don't do things because CU does it that way. I do things because it makes sense physiologically, biomechanically. I understand the body. So he got it, you know, he got it. And, and you know, we had a great relationship and a great run. Um, but, but that's just it, you know, that's people's egos because maybe they played at a certain level. They have certain volleyball credentials. I don't have any of those, but I don't need them. I'm not going out there to coach volleyball. I'm not going out there to play volleyball, I, I, but I will tell you how to train your volleyball athletes to rotationally jump, load, land, and not get hurt in the process, right? So that, that's it. That's what we do. That's what our business is. And the good news is that 98% of the kids are not being taught what we teach. That's good news for us because that's just all kinds of opportunity. The challenge is now finding disciples, right? that like what we hear and want to be a part of it right and that's so that's that's our objective right now you know is like find the disciples train the disciples so they really know all the good reasons all the stuff right and can go teach it and train it teach it in our eight hour clinics teach it locally that's that's our business objective right now is to share the knowledge i have get it out there because it's not something i made up it's not my knowledge it's right. me going and learning the stuff that's out there and putting it together and putting it together in a methodology that is and, and understand my undergrad was in teaching and physical education. So I learned how to teach. I learned the basics of movement. I learned a lot of stuff Then I got into strength. I was a strength coach and exercise physiologist. And then I worked with the largest spine rehab in, in Texas Back Institute. You know, I was a national director of training in Plano for nine years. So I was hired by the two orthopedic surgeons that owned the place. I worked for the head physical therapist, head occupational therapist. That's where I cut my teeth. And then I started training, right? And, and, and doing musculoskeletal injury prevention. And I was actually in Tulsa. I did an injury prevention thing there and because that's what I was doing in industry. And that was 30 something years ago. Yeah. So I worked with General Motors, Texas Instruments, Shell Oil, Oxycam, all these kind of, and I was teaching and teaching people how not to hurt themselves on the job. I when I moved back to Colorado 25 years ago, my son was going through sports and he was doing basketball and one vertical jump training. So he asked if I would go and work with him and his buddy at the park. And we did some hill training, right? Under speed, over speed training down the hill, did jump training. I knew how to do that. Um, <clears throat> a week later, I had the boys basketball team out there. Two weeks later, I had the girls basketball team and the boys Three months later, I had six training facilities, excuse me, three training facilities in Colorado, one in Fort Collins, two in Denver. We were doing baseball, we were doing volleyball, we were doing all kinds of just multi-sport stuff here. So it's yeah. not my first rodeo. I mean, I've learned a lot and, it, and it's now just trying to communicate it, deliver it in a way that people will listen. But the, the biggest thing we run into everywhere in every sport is egos, right? Yep. Egos from people that are just become parrots they are repeating what they heard like a parrot does, like a bird does, instead right. of actually learning and researching and trying to understand more. So, And hey, I told you if you stuck around to the end, I give you free access to our private Facebook group. The links are on the screen down below. Click there, go there, you'll see some of the content I provide for our athletes. And hey, if you like this video, like it down below, subscribe to our channel. If you need further information about PowerCore 360 programs, products, our masterclass, or anything else about PowerCore 360, Go to PowerCore360.com.